everyone. Good afternoon. My name's Rebecca Levingston. I'm from 612 ABC Brisbane. I'm your host for today and welcome to the Ideas Festival. What a buzz in this building. It's fabulous just as you walk inside. Now, I don't want to alarm anybody just as we're beginning this beautiful lunch, but there are some doomsdayers predicting that this weekend the world will end. I'm not sure of the exact time, but it's sometime between now and tomorrow morning. So if we think about it, this could in fact be our last meal before we shuffle off this mortal coil. But let me say this. What better person to share your final meal with than Maggie Beer? Am I right? Here she is. Oh. The lady who gives everyone a buzz. Maggie, have you had one of those experiences where you've, you've had a conversation with someone who just shocked you with their enthusiasm for food? Uh, yes, in fact, it was just recently in um, Albany and, um, is it Albany or Albany? Albany in Western Australia. And Whatever you say is correct. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Let me get, um, and um, I was in this, in this deli and this um, fellow came up to me and he looked, he was a farmer but looked fairly scruffy as a farmer and um, he must have been 88 um, or, or even older and he said to me, you know, my wife died and I never cooked and now I, you have made me cook and I love my life again. And you know, that was, <laughs> that was pretty special. I hold on to that one. Take us back, Maggie, to your childhood oh. dinner table. Oh, yes. Put us at the table. What are you eating and what's the atmosphere like? Well, where... Um, my mum and dad, food was so important to us and um, dad was obsessive about food and, uh, and about offal. And so, yes, <laughs> offal, offal. I was brought up on offal and I just love offal. So we would, it would be a whole animal that would be, even in the city, and it was the western suburbs of Sydney, not Belmont, not the Kemba, <laughs> but very close. Um, and uh, we always had something that was beautiful and had been cooked from scratch, but a tremendous amount of offal, very few roasts, unless it was a chook, um, and that was a very special occasion, and we chopped its head off and plucked it and the whole thing. Because you've got to remember what year I was born. <laughs> you know, it was a bit simpler. Um, uh, but there was lots of conversation about the table, uh, argument as well, um, but the food was always, um, it was beautiful, uh, simple, but I learned very young because of that, um, just how to buy food myself, just by the way, because I would go with mum or dad to buy the food, so I learned about produce as early as that. I think you left school when you were... Ooh! Ooh. <laughs> I think, Maggie, you left school when you were 14. Yes. And, and you say, I, I've heard you say that it, it, it took you about 20 years to figure out what you wanted to do. Oh, it, it did. I, I, I left school at 14 just through necessity. My, my parents had um, a manufacturing business and were bankrupt. Um, and we lost everything. In those days, being bankrupt was really, really tough you know, home, um, home, car, furniture, everything. And so I got dispensation to leave school and as my, and my brother, elder brother did, and uh, we kept the family. Um, uh, my aunt paid for the rent. And um, my point about that was, I had no idea what I wanted to do because the school wanted me to stay on with a scholarship. Um, but um, you have to remember, when I was 14, uh, it was 1959, and my parents, as much as they believed in me, said, but you're only a girl. You'll just get married. You know, you'll just be a secretary and get married. And, and it was, you know, my parents were just like all others of the time. And so I spent a long time not knowing what I wanted to do, but always searching. I was always searching. And then... Was there a moment, was there an experience that made you go, yes, food? Took a long time. <laughs> um, yes, when I came to the Barossa Valley, um, it did, but 
on the way, I did so many things and it's like there was never any waste of time because I had so many different experiences and I sort of saw my life like a jigsaw with all these pieces going in it. Um, and it was the 60s and of course in the 60s you could do almost anything. <laughs> and I travelled I traveled a great deal. Um, so in London there'd be the front page of the, the Times would have all the jobs that you could believe could be. And I got a, I got a job sort of as an air hostess for a moment uh, with British Airways that are defunct now for good reason, but it wasn't me. Um, <laughs> I got a job as a cook in the sailing school in Scotland until they sacked me after six weeks because I used the whole of the, the budget, <laughs> whole of the food in six weeks for the whole season, so they sacked me. Um, I got a job as the assistant to the geophysicist, uh, senior geophysicist in physicist. Oh God, and I've only had one glass <laughs> physicist in Libya, so I was there um, at a very exciting time. Um, so, but all these things that I did, oh, um, Lyft driver in New Zealand and Milne & Choice. So, but I learned so much on the way, and, and I went nursing um, in Sydney, but I injured my spine, so I had to give that up. All the things that I learned on the way um, come down, I did citizenship law for the American government in Sydney. They put me through um, uh, their examinations. So every single thing was part of what brings me today to find it, well, to when I was 34 and came to live in the Barossa. And the Barossa gave me the clue. The Barossa gave me everything about what I wanted to do. And it was just sheer luck. And I guess the reason I say about that journey is so many young people think they've got to know early and all the journey along the way is so worthwhile. Yep. So that was a very long-winded answer. <laughs> I, I like to think of it as a smorgasbord of jobs. Yes. You were just tasting and tasting and tasting. Yes, like being a mutt rather than a <laughs> thoroughbred. <laughs> um, now, you mentioned that I just can't pass this opportunity. In the 60s, you said you could do just about anything. Oh, no, Maggie, no, no, no. <laughs> no, you're no. A, you're, a, you're a, a household name <laughs> and you're loved. <laughs> What's the naughtiest thing you've ever done? Oh, that's, you can't ask that. <laughs> oh, no. My, my daughters I'll might hear about I'll it. I'll ask you a simpler question next if you answer that one. Oh, the naughtiest thing. Well, the silliest thing. Can I do that? Okay. The silliest thing was learning uh, enough Arabic to get by uh, when I lived in Libya and deciding that I would go overland in a native taxi um, from Libya to, um, to Cairo instead of flying because I wanted to go to Turkey to buy some proper Turkish delight. <laughs> and um, I nearly not here today. <laughs> and if I hadn't have learnt enough Arabic to appeal to um, uh, some locals, I, I would have been, you know, in, in the white slave trade, <laughs> even me. <laughs> so, you know, I didn't tell my daughters I didn't tell my daughters that till they were grown up. <laughs> All right, that's satisfying. Okay, a simpler question. Thank you. <laughs> Maggie B, what is your favourite meal? Breakfast, lunch, dinner, or something in between? Oh, look, it, it depends entirely. Um, a couple of... Uh, I'm, I'm lucky enough to be the patron of the um, Produce Awards for Australia. So when it's, when it's um, judging time, I get sent all these beautiful things... And um, three weeks ago, Colin and I were sitting in our garden. It's autumn in the Barossa is so, so beautiful, you wouldn't believe. And we just happened to have um, these oysters from Coffins Bay, the Angassi oysters. We had some Hiramasu kingfish raw. We did have a bottle of French in the fridge. <laughs> and, um, and I thought I was in heaven, you know. And all we needed was a bit of olive oil and a bit of lemon. Nothing more than that. I mean, these are the best of the best, but it can be it can be a lunch that's just tomatoes from the garden and crushed on a bit of good bread with some olive oil. So there's no such thing. It just depends on the produce there is to savour. <laughs> what a diplomatic response. Oh, no, was. it's not diplomatic. It's like she didn't no. even want to alienate one of the meal categories. Oh, no, no. <laughs> 
you, you, you tend not to use recipes, is that true? No, no, I never use a recipe. I just, I, I, I do. Ah, but when I write a recipe, <laughs> I have someone following behind me. Um, no, I, I cook. I've never been taught to cook. Um, I just cook by instinct. And I inherited that from my father um, and my eldest daughter from me and two of my granddaughters um, have it. It's just you know. Whereas my other daughter says, I can't bear it. I have to use a recipe. <laughs> there are two. There are two types of people. <laughs> and and was, was there any? Was there ever any pressure oh, on you to to attain a formal qualification, or did you just? Why? <laughs> no. 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 Because everything we did, both Colin and I are risk takers, and um, everything we did was just one step in front of the other without a grand plan. So I had no idea I'd have the life that I've had. Uh, I was just doing what I loved. Um, so I knew how to cook. And in fact, just I just knew. It would have limited me. Bye bye, Simon. Don't be embarrassed you're going. <laughs> I know you've got a plane. <laughs> um, Simon McKeon, Australian of the Year. Yay. See you, Simon. <laughs> um, where was I? <laughs> oh, God. You just knew. Sorry? You just knew how to cook. Uh, well, and. The thing was, I was never limited because I, I, I knew. And that's the reason, the only reason we had the success we did in the early days is it was Colin's vision to farm pheasants. Um, and that's the reason for coming to South Australia because he's a, a boy from South Malala. And um, therefore, um, the rest was just because I was relating to the produce that he was growing. Um, now, if I had have been trained, I would have been following recipes and it never would have worked. So, yeah. Freedom, it, yeah. Freedom. Freedom, yeah. Outside of your <sighs> beloved Barossa, yeah. tell us about some of your favourite places to source food. I try and source food. Um, my whole food life has started with just the food that's been on our doorstep. Um, in South Australia, that's, you know, the Barossa, but then... We, um, the Riverland for me is very important because I so believe in, I mean, we have to retain our, our, our Riverland towns on the Murray and they do amazing produce in citrus and I happen to love citrus. Um, I try and keep it as local as possible, but that doesn't mean, when I was up here last week um, at Noosa, so I was using Red Claw and avocado and Wherever I am, I want to use the food that comes from uh, from where I am, the region. Yeah. Mm. Well, I was going to say um, here in southeast Queensland, of, well, most of Queensland, our, our farmers have copped just such a terrible yes. time um, with everything from bananas and, and cane up in North mm. Queensland down to the salad bowl of the Lockyer Valley, um, you know, to the melon and the pumpkin farmers in in, in Boona. When you were in Noosa last weekend, was there a, a particular flavour or, or food experience that you had that sort of st stood out to you? That oh, yes, perhaps there was one that stood back? out to me, but I don't think you like the answer. Huh? Yes, <laughs> no. we will. <laughs> no, no. Well, it stood out. You asked what stood out to me. Okay. Um, on, on the Friday, um, my daughter Saskia was there with me, and we were doing a luncheon for 120 people. And, um, and it was great. Um, there was a lot of work, but um, ah, the ice cream was melting as we were serving it. But that's a small, a small matter, but that's why I understand kitchens that are having difficulty. Um, but what stood out to me on Saturday, we did a demonstration and there were 500 people and there was a, a hall full of other people outside watching on a big screen. And afterwards I was so drained and exhausted and yet euphoric as you get. Um, that I thought, oh, I'm going for a swim. Um, and I got this phone call as I was walking over and said, what about the course for 120 tonight? Ah, I'd forgotten all about the fact that I had to cook one course only for 120 people. And that was my worst experience of Noosa. But I did it. I did it. What and did you make? Well, because... Now, this will show how disorganized I am. Three months ago, I'd been asked, and I sent up a recipe. So they had the ingredients. But having the ingredients is one thing, and cooking a course for 120 is another. And so I had 
but because it was about the Produce Awards, I had Nolan's Road um, uh, lentils, which lentils, you might think they're just a healthy food. When, when they are from the season and local and fresh and with lots of extra virgin olive oil, uh, I had, was given some oil that had been crushed three days before to use with it. And I had eggplant and tomato and um, uh, lemon. God, what else did I have? Lots of fresh herbs. But everyone else had seafood or meat. So I, I had the veggie and some goats, some local goat's cheese. So I pulled it together, but I was a bit stressed. <laughs> I bet you it was absolutely delicious. Uh, there are some really creative things going on in southeast Queensland with food. A, a friend of mine was telling me recently about a concept called Herd Share. And it's, uh, I think, uh, like a hobby farm in yeah. Warwick, not too far from here, where you invest in uh, a herd of dairy cattle and the dividend comes back to you in, in food, in milk, in cheese, wow. those sorts of things. Do you know of any other examples of, of things like that where people are asking you to, you know, get in touch with the farm and then... Well, I was just talking a few minutes ago about something I um, launched a few weeks ago in the Barossa Valley at Mount Pleasant, which is a very small town in the Barossa. It's sort of on the edge of the Barossa. And this is um, a food swap. And there's no money that changes hands. There are big trestle tables in the local hall. And people uh, are members and they bring in food. And if in the autumn, as it is now, they've got lots of food, but they don't have much in winter, or if they have lots of food in summer and not in winter, they take when they have none and give when they have. Um, mm. And so total honesty, and it's brought the community together like you wouldn't believe. Yeah. It is so good. So there are all sorts of, the more people think about it, the more scope there is to do really exciting and innovative things to bring people close to the land. And um, I know you're only here briefly, but we hope that you'll, you'll come back to Queensland again sometime soon. We have some fabulous community gardens here. Yeah. One of the biggest is Northey Street in, in Windsor. Oh. Um, there's a, uh, someone here from there? A gorgeous market attached to that. Um, Bielorong in, in Morningside, which is just, it's, it's so professionally run, and yet it still has that heart of, you know, come on in, join with us. When, and, and and how do you manage to have time to, to keep making these connections with these community ah, gardens well, and foodies? It's easy. It, if you believe in something, and <coughs> I've been lucky enough to have been given a platform, right? So talk about gardens. The thing that I'm very involved with Stephanie Alexander in the kitchen gardens and ambassador for her in South Australia, which is one of the loveliest things that I do, but this being Senior Australian of the Year last year has made me understand about aged care and, um, and the disgrace of it, quite frankly, in so much of Australia. So what, I, what my new journey, well, I guess I've always been involved in some way, but I'm trying to work on a federal level to change a culture in aged care so that food is a joy for the people that are lost in, just totally lost, without a voice. Really, I mean, I know they can complain if something's wrong, but they don't, they don't have a voice, they don't have joy to look forward to in most cases, and there are wonderful exceptions. But this is where we have to have gardens and cooks and community all coming together. You know, we can't see it in silos. We have to be a, a community in the larger sense. And, um, and I spent Thursday in Melbourne going to aged care places and um, Meals on Wheels. And, you know, you have to have champions and you have to have people that really care. Um, and we have to change. Now yeah. that is an idea worth pursuing. Yes, worth it is. Talking about. <laughs> have, you, have, you, have you got government back? Have you got people interested? Oh, yes, yes. I spoke um, last year, this being the senior Oz, you were asked to do so many things, you just asked Simon. <laughs> um, but he's the real deal, you know, the Australian of the year. But even so, um, I, I was asked to speak to a thousand CEOs of aged care for their annual conferences in Tasmania. So I did a lot of work and, and did a lot of research into what is and what happens and put my own thoughts as to how it can be better. And in fact, I got all my 
food friends, you know, Stephanie, uh, Damien, um, oh, just the whole lot of them to submit recipes for aged care. And so I, I presented them with a, a booklet of some 30 such recipes. Um, and, but the thing is, that thousand people, most of them wanted to lynch me and others because they won't accept. Um, but others just loved and have, I've got so many letters and um, people that want to join the, the battle, but so does Mark Butler, our um, federal minister, because he's a Port Adelaide man. And I can <laughs> ring, I, the first week he was in office, I rang him up and he rang straight back. And he wants to change the culture too. So when, when you have people um, in, the, in politics that want change, we'll help them. <laughs> well, yeah, I think, yeah. <laughs> yeah. But we have to have a plan, and it's not overnight you get a plan. Mm, yeah. Well, but agitating is pretty good. Yes. Well, now and now we all know we, you know, yes. you heard people react when you mentioned yeah. aged care. Yes. I mean, parents we've got a baby, mm. a generation of baby boomers who are. About oh, the to baby go boomers into. are going to be okay because they're going to demand everything. <laughs> it's okay. <laughs> now, Maggie, meals are on the table, so yeah. we're going to have a little break very shortly, um, so that you can. Uh, in, enjoy that but before you go you mentioned uh, your f good friend Stephanie Alexander a yeah. couple of times yeah. there and I, can I make a little confession I tried to make a Stephanie Alexander dish last week it was my birthday and I didn't want a cake cake Stephanie has a, a, a gorgeous recipe for it's a rhubarb and gingerbread uh, sponge combination you have your, the rhubarb yeah. in the bottom and you bake it yeah. and it's amazing something I did there was so much water came out of the rhubarb and then we went ahead and put 34 candles on top of the sponge cake. 34, and and, and the candles, not only were they burning on the top, they collapsed into the sponge and, and the wax melted into... But fortunately, my family still ate it. But Maggie, please, just... I, you almost shared with us a, a disaster or a flop from, from the Food and Wine Festival. Yeah. You pulled that off last weekend. Have you ever made something that, that didn't work out? Oh, of course. Of course. Um, the, uh, and, you know, in all the years of the pheasant farm, uh, my husband will say I was practicing on my customers every day, and I did, because I never, I only decided on the day what I was going to do. So disorganized, frenetic, and so, uh, but I, I hope that the ones that didn't work out went in the bin. <laughs> Maggie, you are fabulous. And when you come back, can we talk a little bit more about food futures and happiness? Yes. All right. Thank Maggie you. Beer. gentlemen hello 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 I know you're all enjoying the food hopefully no one over there is getting getting wet you're looking a little wind blown you're fine that's good Maggie beers here of course you're fine now Maggie you're taking off soon so we, we need to get uh, you to look into your crystal ball a little bit um, we need to talk a little bit about food futures. One of the big movements here during the floods was a, an idea called Baked Relief, where people who couldn't pick up a shovel and, and muck out mud debris baked for yeah. volunteers. And there were a lot of young women, specifically, who got involved in that. You think there's a return to the kitchen of young people? Um, I think there is, and I think we've got to do everything we can to support it. Um, and I was talking before about Stephanie Alexander's Kitchen Garden Foundation, where... Um, children, 9, 10, 11, 12, four years, they're learning to grow and cook. But um, uh, because I live in the country, in Barossa Valley, um, we have agricultural shows, um, and as most country areas do. And I know that's not the city, but it goes right across the board, and we're all seeing an absolute return to um, the baking competitions, and I'm never going to judge one, I can tell you. <laughs> but um, uh, I think whether it's television has had its place to bringing children into the world of food that they haven't had at their own table, whatever it is, it's, it's worthy of support. 
even if it just comes from television, it's worthy of support. Well, speaking of television, you've done a, st a stint recently on MasterChef. Is it as stressful as it seems on TV? Yes, yes, yes. Why? Oh. Why do they put that much pressure on these people? Well, well they put it on themselves. You've got to remember, um, it is so stressful because they're on such a steep learning curve. They also have a 13-hour day for that one hour of television. It's a 13-hour day. And they are there. So many of those people are there because they're wanting to change their life. That's the really interesting thing. And if they last through the period, they become really competent cooks. So, but they all see it as, as um, a change in life. And that doesn't mean they're changing because they want to cook. They want to change their life full stop. You know, like a lawyer who doesn't want to be a lawyer <laughs> and wants to be a cook instead or a writer. And that's what young Adam Law was um, uh, last year. So yes, the pressure is real. I feel it. I feel it. <laughs> I felt it. Um, I believe you, me. While we're on TV, I'm uh, curious to ask you as well. Of course, Heston Blumenthal is the oh, other, you yes. know, the, the big TV who's oh, brought the, the genius, the, the, the you know, the laboratory to yeah. the kitchen with his whether it's bacon and egg ice cream or something that explodes in your mouth. What do you make of that so style of cooking? Well, that's not all he does, though. You see, that's the really thing. He's just such an inquisitive person. Um, he, he's, I think, uh, you know, bordering on genius. And he wants to know everything. But he'll also do a whole show. You know, this is only Britain that could happen. Um, a whole show where he spends a whole hour searching the perfect pizza, which means he has to search the perfect flour. So he is very down to earth as well as being up in the clouds. But it's all about... Um, uh, it's an intellectual journey for him, but it never loses food flavor, the flavor of food. Very interesting man. Fascinating. Frightening, though. The, the oh, most recent one, I think, that was on TV, you talked about liking or having awful as a memory yes. of your childhood. Did a whole thing with a, a Dracula theme, and there was a lot of blood involved. <laughs> well, Maggie, I know you have to leave soon, but yes. we, we started off today, and I said this could, in fact, be our last supper. <laughs> <laughs> if you, Maggie Beard, knew that you were consuming uh, your last ever meal, okay, what would it be? What would I have? Well, there's one thing that I would have, and that would be sea urchin. And I would get the sea urchins and cut the top off and just... <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I'm just imagining it. And just slip them down. And it, they would have to be perfect, though. They would have to be really orangey, sweet, nutty, irony of the sea. And I would just fill myself till I was ill on sea urchin. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, Maggie Beer. I'm sorry I have to race. Thank you.